European Green Deal with Sakia Katabi, Green Belgium Minister, with Eamon Ryan as Green Irish Minister, and Terry Letunen, State Secretary at the Green Finnish Ministry of the Environment. And as moderator, we are very happy to have Eva van der Racht, Director of Director of the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Brussels. And we will be accompanied by uh, the important work of our interpreters as well. Thank you very much for that. So all together, we have uh, very strong European experts today for talking about the European Green Deal and the positive implications it can have when we implement it. Because we Greens in Europe, we all share the view that for us, climate change is the greatest challenge human beings are ever faced. And we can see what we should do against the climate change and what we can do to protect our climate and our environment. And the European Union has committed itself to be the world's first climate neutral continent and correspondingly to a green economy with net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 at the latest. And this objective is right in the center of the European Green Deal and in line with the EU's commitment to global climate action under the Paris Agreement. And the European Green Deal is an all sectors comprising set of legislative actions and proposals. And it will bring changes involving the economy, the technology and the society, of course. And as green members of the parliament, we work on very practical ways to implement the European Green Deal and how we can turn political requests and laws into concrete actions. And in our two-day Green Deal online conference with the insights and uh, expertise of lots of experts, we invite you to take a comprehensive look at all the various aspects of the European Green Deal. Tomorrow morning, you can discuss it with green MEPs in five parallel high profile webinars. You will, have, you will have trouble to choose one because there are so many interesting topics and people to meet, I can assure you that. And in the webinars, we will talk about the European climate, energy and mobility policy on the way to climate neutrality. And of course, also about the necessary social ecological transformation of the economy and the industry. You can meet myself again in the letter if you want to. And we would also talk about an agricultural and environmental policy that protects and preserves our natural resources. We will also have a look on the Green Deal as a green investment program, considering as well its social dimension. And last but not least, we will talk about the Green Deal in the global context of foreign trade and development policy. And if you have a short look in the chat, you will find the links to these webinars and we will be happy to see you there tomorrow morning as well. In the end, Scar Keller and Sven Beagle will end our conference at 11 tomorrow morning with a sum up of the results of these two day conference. And um, we are just very happy to, to have the chance to talk with you and to discuss with you this very important topic. Becoming the world's first climate neutral continent by 2050 is the greatest challenge and opportunity of our times. And the EU can lead the way by investing in realistic technological solutions, empowering citizens and aligning action in key areas such as industrial policy, finance and research while ensuring social fairness for a just transition. And while investing hundreds of billions of euros in rescuing our economy from the current COVID pandemic, we should, not, we should not throw money at the old economy or dinosaur technology. We must guide our societies to a cleaner and healthier future, one that our children can embrace with hope uh, instead of fear. So with this, I'm giving the floor to Eva van der Racht, um, Director of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung's European Union Office in Brussels and our moderator for tonight's session. Thank you very much and I'm looking forward to your thoughts. Yeah, thank you, dear Henrike, for your kind introduction and good evening to everyone. I am very honored to moderate this debate on the European Green Deal with three Green government representatives and a Green member of the European Parliament. It is good news that in the past years, more Green parties have joined government coalitions to advance in the Green agenda in Europe. Before we will start our discussion, please allow me to make a few technical remarks, which we'll also find in the chat in detail. 
This event is interpreted simultaneously into German and English by clicking on the globe button at the bottom of your screen. You will be able to find the language channel you prefer. Participants have the possibility to ask questions by using the Q&A button. Staff members will cluster the questions and we will try to address as many aspects raised by the audience later on in the discussion. Please use the button chat for technical questions. The staff in the background will be happy to help. And uh, the last technical comment, um, this webinar is recorded and streamed on the YouTube page of the German Green Party in the European Parliament. The link will be posted in the chat. And in case you follow the webinar on the YouTube stream and need interpretation, please join us on Zoom. The registration details are published as a comment below the YouTube stream. Well, in this opening webinar of the two days conference on the European Green Deal, we would like to discuss the following questions. What role does the European Green Deal play in the EU member states where Greens are in government? How do the Greens assess the European Green Deal so far? Where do they see opportunities? Where do they see challenges? What is the approach of Greens in government to make sure an ambitious European Green Deal will be implemented in the years to come? Please allow me to introduce our distinguished speakers from Belgium, Ireland, Finland, and Germany. I would like to cordially welcome Zakia Katabi, Belgian Minister for Climate, Environment, Sustainable Development, and the Green Deal. The current Belgian government was formed in 2020 amidst the pandemic, and the so-called Vivaldi coalition consists of seven parties belonging to the liberal, Christian democratic left, and Green Party families, the Green Party's Ecolo and Hun received four ministerial posts. Sakia wishes the European Green Deal to become a foundation of the European project for the 21st century, a new founding act for a responsible, solidary and sustainable Europe. A warm welcome to you, Sakia. It's very good to have you here with us today. The warm welcome also goes to Eamon Ryan, Irish Minister for Transport and Minister for the Environment, Climate and Communications. In 2020, three parties agreed to enter a liberal conservative Green government coalition in Ireland, where the Greens have three ministers. Eamon's vision for the European Green Deal is an effective and collaborative approach towards a low carbon, clean, green, healthy, diverse, prosperous, thriving Europe that delivers a sustainable future for all. I would also like to warmly welcome Terry Letonen, State Secretary at the Finnish Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. And uh, 2019, the current left liberal green Finnish government took office consisting of five parties. Within this coalition, the Finnish Greens hold three ministerial posts. Terry's vision for the European Green Deal is Europe living within planetary boundaries where citizens are healthier, and better off in a climate-neutral, toxic, free circular economy and where biodiversity and ecosystems are being restored. A very warm welcome to you, Terry, as well. Last but not least, I'm very pleased to introduce Henrike Hahn to you, member of the European Parliament for the Greens European Free Alliance. She is member of the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, member of the Delegation for the Relations with the United States and member of the Delegation for the Relations with the People's Republic of China. Henrike is Deputy Spokesperson of the German Green Party in the European Parliament. And once again, Henrike, also welcome to you. Henrike's vision for the European Green Deal is that it has to be at the core of European politics to work together rapidly and efficiently towards a zero carbon sustainable and solidary Europe, Henrike is convinced that the European Green Deal is the best tool we can use to build our future. We will now listen to the inputs of our speakers and I would like to give the floor to Zakia. Zakia, you are minister in charge of the Green Deal. What role does the European Green Deal play in Belgium and what do you expect from the EU institutions and other member states? The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Eva. Uh, dear colleagues, dear participants, good evening, and dear Enrique and Sven, thank you for inviting me to share my insights in setting the course of the European Green Deal. And uh, to structure my contribution, let me use the terms of the webinars that will be organized tomorrow morning. 
However, first, I would like to make uh, some observations that are valid as well for my policy in Belgium. So first consideration, it's about science-based. Uh, as ecologists, we do have science at our side. Whether we read the assessment reports with regard to the non-planetary boundaries on climate change, loss of biodiversity, etc., cetera, uh, or we take note of the reports analyzing social considerations uh, on the worldwide gap between the poor and the rich, the poverty in Europe, the gender inequality, etc. Science lead us the way forward. Second consideration, it's about the COVID-19. Uh, and um, the crisis, the crisis has further accentuated uh, what is going wrong in our society. Two examples, the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions was clearly a temporary phenomenon. And the vulnerable groups have been pushed even more into poverty. So structural measures are therefore necessary. And indeed, building back, back better via social ecological transformation of the economy is crucial and urgent. The webinar organized around this theme and the one on the European Green Deal that needs to be sustainable, efficient and just do have an important task to set the course. In my mind, we need to articulate again and again that just transition is at the heart of our policy making as Greens be it at the European or national level. One important part of the roadmap is paving the way towards climate neutrality. However, to get the people at our side, we need to imagine a bright future for our society when shaping the future of economy, transport and energy. I don't know if you, ha if you have seen the video, a message from the future with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. It's an example, you should have a look. It's really inspiring. And um, based on the scientific recommendations for policy making, let's develop a storytelling how we can fulfill the vital functions for children and grandchildren by 2050 if we act now. How we can provide shelter, food care, clothing, etc., to people to just transition by no one leaving behind. Dear colleagues, uh, tomorrow two webinars are organized around teams that are worrisome to me. The first one is agriculture and biodiversity in the European Green Deal. For many decades, the common agricultural policy didn't respect the current principles, do not significantly harm and do not roll back. With almost half of the European budget, CAP allowed the agro-industrial system to deteriorate our environment within the European Union and abroad. One example, imported deforestation for production and consumption patterns of our agriculture and food system. I learned that within a couple of days, a super trilogue will be organized by the Portuguese presidency of the European Union to seek a breakthrough in common agricultural policy talks. To me, the results should be green or there, should, or there should not be results. And dear friends, let's not forget that we are on the side of our farmers who are tied hands and feet to the agro industry. If you, want, uh, if you want to learn more about it, uh, I think that you have to invite our dear friends, uh, Professor Olivier Descuter. It relates directly to the theme of the last webinar, Green Deal Girls International, Green Deal in External Trade and Development Policies. Numerous examples exist on how our agriculture and food system in Europe disturb local markets in the, last, in the least developing countries. Greens have an important role to play in the European Parliament and in our governments in influencing the contents of trade agreements. Policy coherence can, must lead us. Dear Enrique Desfan, to conclude this first intervention, I want to say that the European Commission can be, in my experience at the national level, our ally for some policies. 
I am referring uh, to the requirement to get support for recovery and resilience facility. However, for other politics, policies, sorry, like on agriculture and trade, there is still a long way to go. In my eyes, the greatest virtue of the Green Deal is its systemic approach. The challenges we have to meet in terms of environment, climate and sustainable development indeed require the transversal involvement of all government departments in order to respond to the urgent needs of a just transition. It's a huge cultural challenge and the Green Deal, whatever we think of its real ambition, of its real concrete actions, through its systemic approach is my, is our best ally in this necessary cultural revolution. Thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to take part in the debate. Thank you very much, Zakia, for this overview and for already pointing to um, some of the contradictions and the challenges. Um, Eamon, I would like to ask you, what role does the European Green Deal play in Ireland and what do you expect from the EU institutions and other member states? The floor is yours. Thank you, Eva. Um, it plays an important role because it's a signal, another signal, that this is the way the world is going. And, and that's why I bring it home by saying, oh, look, this is what Europe thinks, therefore we should too. Is, um, and, and I think what you say is also true there, just to back up what Sakia says is, we use the European Union, we often use it as the, as the to blame, you know, oh, I wouldn't do this decision, but, but European Union is getting us to do it, or else we have the European Union as this saint, this kind of brilliant institution by, where we say we should do it because the European Union is doing it. Um, I've just come out of the day, I spent the day at the European Council, the Environment Council, and it was really interesting. Uh, so my head is full of the discussions we've had today on that, all the good things and bad things. And if I can pick up what Zaki says, because I think she made the point very well, um, maybe one of the, in relation to the Green Deal, that we can see this contradiction, all good, but same time short of what we need in the area of agriculture, particularly, because we are facing a biodiversity crisis as well as a climate crisis. And we also have a pollution crisis with ammonia, nitrogen, water pollution. And I was saying today at the European Council, at the European Council, you would, we were all green. Everyone was agreeing we would restore biodiversity, we would be uh, good on climate and, and so on. But, but in re and that's in the Environment Council where we can say that openly and easily. And actually, because there's a lot of good green ministers on it. Um, but is that the same in the Agriculture Council? I don't think it is. And, and I think, and even, okay, we have the farm to fork strategy and it's, it's like, uh, it's like what, you know, a, a pious prayer, but, but is it actually what we, we, we live out? Uh, not yet. So, so I think, um, and I think the advantage of us or what we need to do with the European Green Dean is make sure that those elements are, are, are really are changed. Um, and I think there's various advantages to that. One of the advantages, if we went to a less intensive agricultural system, a less, and we don't go down the road of carbon efficiency in agriculture, which could be bad for biodiversity, if you know what I mean, we could, we could all measure it in something that's maybe carbon efficient, but not biodiversity rich. If, if we're really to go with that agenda, it will lead towards a more pastoral farming, more family farming, less intense, less industrial, not big lots, not big farms. And one of the good things about this is we might get allies in the East as well as in our own countries, because a lot of some of the Eastern countries, often of whom are depicted as being kind of <coughs> opposed to climate or you know, not as ambitious as the countries in Western part of Europe, well, actually, in this area, a lot of their agricultural systems is less intense and would benefit if we start to really reward and value nature-based solutions, rich, rich in biodiversity type agriculture. It might be easier for some countries that were not historically seen as being allied on the climate agenda. That would be one advantage. A second advantage, if we applied the same 
um, metrics and, and values in terms of what we want in agriculture to succeed, it might also help some of those farmers in Africa who are not the problem cause of climate change, but are the ones who are worst hit by it. And, 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 and we might then start rewarding, if we, if we financially reward in Europe less intense farming, we might get the IMF or the World Bank or the international finance institutions to similarly reward those farmers in Africa that are less intense and less industrial and so on. And that might be a very useful um, outcome of, of where we're going with the Green Deal. Um, and I just picked that out because it was a frustration for me today. I, I got the sense we're all talk and we're not talking in the Agriculture Council the same way and same in a variety of areas. Like, you know, we're all talk about decarbonizing transport, but well, we couldn't introduce standards to stop the, construct the sale of combustion engine cars by 2030. So there's these, there's all the good things and then there's the contradictions and, and we need to focus on the contradictions, I think, and, and do it because what we're going to propose, and this is why the Green Deal is a good project, is because it's a better economy. It's not a hardship, it's not a negativity, it's you know, switching away from combustion engines is gonna be good for Europe. It, or, or, or else we'll end up buying Chinese technology or an American technology. And we'll end up you know, not having, not, not, not showing leadership. So, so um, sorry for this kind of contradictory feeling, but it comes out of the council today. We're all talk, it's now time for action and it's time for action not just in the environment areas, but in agriculture and in the motor industry and in in some of the areas where we still have a lot of resistance. Thank you very much, Iman, um, for your insights in the Environmental Council and also for um, actually pointing out contradictions you see, um, but also actually um, opportunities. Um, so I would now like to give the floor to Terry. Terry, from a Finnish perspective, um, what does the European Green Deal, what, which role does the European Green Deal play and um, what do you expect from the EU institutions? Which contradictions do you see? Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Th thank you, Henrika, uh, for, for the invitation. Um, dear members, dear, dear ministers, thank you very much for, for um, uh, asking me to join today's uh, conversation. When, when I was thinking about the, um, the big picture on the, on the European Green Deal, it reminds me that um, the European Greens have advocated for a Green New Deal as long as I can remember, at least 10 years. It was, um, the concept was uh, to fight against the economic crisis uh, through investment measures for the stimulation of eco industries to create jobs and to create a green modernization of the European economy. Now the, green, the European Green Deal is at the heart of EU action and at the core of its economic strategy. So it's a plan to make the EU economy sustainable and make Europe the first climate neutral continent. The aim is to boost efficient use of resources by moving to a clean circular economy, but importantly also to restore biodiversity and cut pollution. So something clearly that we've been, we've been all asking for. Now, at the heart of the Green Deal is, is also our commitment to climate action commensurate with the science and Paris Agreement objectives. And we in Finland are trying to do our part by setting climate, neutral, a climate neutrality target to uh, 2035. And, and we're working towards negative emissions soon after that. We're in the process of reviewing our climate act to set binding emission reduction goals and the climate neutrality into the law. And we're in the process of developing policies and measures across the economy to put us firmly on the right path. We are also stepping up considerably our investment into biodiversity protection and nature restoration. We are developing nature-based solutions for climate change mitigation and adaptation. We're in the 
at the moment finalizing a new strategic circular economy program with quantitative targets to reduce resource consumption and double our resource productivity and recycled material use in the economy. The government also invited key sectors of industry to develop um, low carbon roadmaps, the energy, chemicals, forestry, and technology industries in, in particular. All of those sectors cooperated and came up with their roadmaps and actually many more sectors joined. I think we had in the end 13 sectors of the economy coming up with their uh, car low carbon roadmaps, cl climate neutrality roadmaps, essentially. So those roadmaps provide in information on the emission reduction potential of e in each sector and, and what are the enabling conditions and required that are required to unlock them. Uh, and this is to inform our climate and energy policies, but also to show the commitment of the private sector. So I think it, it makes a difference <laughs> uh, to, to ha have Greens in the, in the government. While some of these uh, areas is, is clearly also, like I said, the whole European Green Deal shows that uh, some of the things that we've been calling for are moving into the mainstream. Uh, when the COVID pandemic devastated our societies and, and put our economies also uh, in life support, on life support, uh, Finland decided early on to direct financial economic recovery resources to action that also speeds up the necessary climate transition. The government also decided to use at least half of the EU recovery and resilience facility funding to direct climate action. Now, dear friends, the, the, the European Green Deal that will deliver Europe living within the planetary boundaries requires action at European level at national level, at state level, and at, at local level. I think at the European level, the next important milestone will be the upcoming Fit for 55 package, which is due in June. We will need to ensure that EU will achieve at least 55% uh, target through emission reductions while maintaining and enhancing the land sector carbon sink. The sectoral legislation should aim to overshoot that target. For a toxic-free Europe, we will also need to have more and better rules at the European level. In general, we need the sustainability standards for products and supply chains to apply across the in entire internal market. And we should make the internal market work as a lab for moving to a circular economy. For, for bringing about a sustainability transformation of the food system, as, as Eamon was so well <laughs> pointing out, the EU agriculture policy, uh, I'm afraid, will not be sufficient. But we should use national leeway and domestic policies to go further. Now, much of our Green Deal has, has become mainstream EU ob ob objective. We like Eamon already said, we must now ensure the words are translated into action and that it will bring us within the planetary boundaries. And to do so, uh, and this is also something that Zakia said, we need to turn climate and ecological challenges into opportunities in a just and inclusive manner. I think I will leave it at this for the introductory part. Uh, many thanks uh, for the opportunity to join and I look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, and now I would like to um, pass the floor to Henrike. Henrike, how do the Greens in the European Parliament um, assess the European Green Deal so far? And Terry already mentioned the Fit, uh, fit for um, 55 package. What are the Greens negotiation successes and what are main votes still pending? Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so uh, while much of the world's activity stood still during the lockdowns and the shutdowns, our main focus for 2021 
has to be again to, live, to deliver a sustainable and inclusive economic recovery that leaves no citizen behind. So I think we all, uh, all the kind spe co-speakers were mentioning that as well. That's, that's in our high, heart and head as well. And with the pandemic, it was even more obvious than before that, that backsliding is no option. We don't want to return to economic activity based on fossil fuels at the expense of climate, nature and human beings. So in December 2019, Europe has committed itself to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050 at the latest. And the European Commission presented a set of policy initiatives, the European Green Deal. And as Terry said before, that was something that we Greens used to work on since quite a while. It was already in our concepts and in our heads, right? Uh, so finally, the EU leaders agreed to a greenhouse gas emission reduction target of at least 55% by 2030, what the Council supports as well, but the Parliament is much more ambitious and demands 60%. It's a clear bargain success from the Greens. I mean, we Greens, if we could make a wish, we would speak with the scientists and uh, demand um, 65%. But nevertheless, this is a really uh, a success. It's a real success from the Green perspective as well um, that we have here now. Um, and so in the current negotiations for the climate law, member states continuously block to talk about the climate goals for 2030 at the moment. This is just the situation. And the discussions about an independent scientific climarat and to a, to, to a CO2, CO2 budget doesn't make the necessary progress. So let's see what happens there. But of course, we will push from our green perspective that we get really good results here. And we definitely need an ambitious European climate law to deliver on to the Paris Agreement. So green, the Green Deal also leads our way out of the crisis. Uh, and one third of the investments from our recovery plan, Next Generation EU, will finance the goals set out in the European Green Deal. Together with the EU budget, we are investing 1.8 trillion euro, and this will bring massive investments to build forward to better and more sustainable economy for all. And let's say it in a very positive way, um, the European Green Deal is our strategy for sustainable growth, right? So this is a term that um, is rather used in a conventional way, but we can say it really here, it's, it's, it's for sustainable growth. And Europe, the European Green Deal is at the heart of the post-COVID-19 recovery. Also last year in January 2020, the um, European Commission presented the European Green Deal's Just Transition Mechanism and the Sustainable Europe Investment Plan. And the Just Transition Mechanism will guarantee that no one is left behind in the green transition, which is very important, of course, right? Um, the sake of the people involved in that process. And while moving away from fossil fuels like coal, lignite, peat, and oil shell will provide tailored financial and practical support to help workers and generate the necessary investments in regions most affected by the transition, it will make investments more attractive with an overall financial package worth at least 100 billion euros. So that's a lot of money. And of course, it's very important how we invest it. And the investment plan will mobilize public investment and help unlock private funds through EU financial instruments, notably the Invest EU, leading to a total of at least one trillion of invest euro of investments. However, the biggest package under the umbrella of the Green Deal is on the Commission's agenda for this year. Um, you were mentioning it before. Um, by this summer, the European Commission will revise the entire climate and energy legislation to make it fit for 55, means fit for a 55 greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. And if the greenhouse gas emissions in the EU are to be reduced by at least 55% by 2030, all existing laws and regulations from the areas of energy and climate must also be adapted and tightened up accordingly. So this is a, an important work and a complicated work, but of course something we are very passionate about and which is really something um, which is wonderful to work on, right? So far, the Fit for 55 package only contains announcement, which laws are to be revised for the parliament, especially uh, for us Greens. It will therefore be crucial how we can now introduce our amendments into the commission's proposed initiatives. 
And our green demands in this context are the following, including among others, for example, harnessing the potential of effective energy taxation. Um, for us, the revision of the 2003 Energy Taxation Directive and thus a possible new tax, tax mechanism must be in future measured against potential damage to the environment and climate. Interesting, the German perspective on the last try to revise that was very interesting. So let's see if, it, if it's going to uh, change uh, in the election year now. So through a reward mechanism for climate friendly and resource efficient production practices, as well as the integration of the poly to pace principle through a CTOT tax, it's possible to set good and proper incentives for sustainable practices. And as a second demand, we have the introduction of an effective CO2 border adjustment mechanism to explain what it means. Again, um, a CO2 border adjustment system can prevent the relocation of CO2 incentive intensive industries to other less regulated countries and thereby ensure fair comp competitive conditions between member states and industrial producers worldwide. So maybe we could discuss that at a later stage as well, because it's a very interesting um, aspect, of course. And then currently, the building sector accounts for around 40% of primary energy consumption in the European Union. And we therefore urgently need greater energy efficiency through the revision of the energy efficiency directive, for example, through a mandatory renovation of all public buildings. So we can see here a very concrete um, example for real change, how we can really change something. And then we have the adaption of the Renewable Energies Directive that has to be adapted to the more ambitious climate uh, target. It must clear the way for a massive expansion of solar and wind energy in particular and be 100% renewable and must not promote low carbon fuels of fossil or nuclear origin. So uh, what will be also on the table and very interesting is that in a few weeks, at the end of April, the European Commission will present a revised EU industrial strategy. As, as you remember, we received uh, a version last year, but of course, from a green perspective, that wasn't enough. We, there can always be more. We can always change uh, much more than that. And first of all, we demand that uh, aligning of the, strategy, of the strategy with the EU's 2030 climate and energy targets, targets is very important. This includes developing greenhouse gas emissions reduction pathways for each industrial sector. This is something we always repeat. Um, we always repeat during our discussions. This is something that we really need in line with the EU's 2030 climate goals. And we call for an ambitious reform of the EU emissions trading system and effort sharing regulation to deliver on the EU's climate targets and support the implementation of an effective carbon border adjustment mechanism, as mentioned before. So we also want to link the ecological and digital transformation. So um, the digital sector must take full account of the EU's climate targets giving high priority to resource and energy efficiency. We have to ensure that the design of devices, infrastructure and digital services follow eco-design and circular economy principles to build on and extend uh, beyond product, product requirements as already identified in the circular economy action plan. Then what is also important for us, we want to ensure the application of the energy efficiency first principle. We must invest in energy efficiency and energy saving technologies in all sectors to save money and to save energy, and also to enhance the global competitiveness of European industries by becoming providers of these technologies, right? Made in Europe in a positive way, right? Um, so symbolizing that we are on the top of, of uh, the technology, but also as um, um, a climate saver somehow, right? And then we want to use the full potential of renewables. Um, we also want to concentrate on highly energy efficient renewable based heating and cooling. And we think it's important to establish a resource efficiency first principle across all EU legislation, as well as sector-specific EU targets for resource, resource efficiency. 
And then um, it's important too to create lead markets for climate neutral technologies, products and services to help businesses through the ecological transition to improve governance, transparency and synergies. And also to recognize fully the civil society as a stakeholder in all this process, right? In green industrial policy as well, and the need for its involvement in the various vehicles as societal acceptance of industrial policy and transitions. So, because uh, when we when we want to implement change, right? It's the old thing we always discuss. Um, you have to involve the people who are concerned with with that change, right? We we need to to listen to their opinion, to their expertise, and this is something that is very important as well. So let me conclude by saying that our path to carbon, carbon neutrality offers great opportunities for innovation, growth and sustainable jobs. And European companies know this already. They bet on the opportunities offered by clean technologies at an early stage, but this can only happen with due diligence and the highest environmental and societal standards. And this is what we work on in the European Parliament, what we Greens fight for in the European Parliament. And the European Green Deal will affect almost all aspects of our daily lives. It will also make our lives better, right? So it's really worth fighting for it. And the European Green Deal involves much more than cutting emissions. It's about making systemic modernization. It's about agriculture, as Sakia said before, right? We have to take it as a unique opportunity to build a better future for us. And I uh, hope that we Greens in Europe will fight with um, all the power we have, right? We do that. And we do, uh, we do that as well in the European Parliament. Thank you very much, um, Henrike. I would like to come back uh, to Zakia with a question. Well, you uh, mentioned the COVID-19 crisis um, has hit economies around the world. Governments had to mobilize unprecedented amounts of money to stabilize markets and enable a fast recovery, um, you stressed uh, the need of a, of a just and sustainable transition. What role could and should the European Green Deal play in this regard? Could you go a little bit more into detail when it comes to, um, to recovery? The floor is yours. Oui, merci. Um, merci, Eva. Je pense que um, la pandémie nous a confronté de la manière la plus brutale qu'il soit Euh, aux fragilités d'un modèle euh, dont on a tous profité jusqu'à présent, hein. ceux qui le dénonçaient comme ceux qui ont, voilà, qui ont cru dans un modèle euh, de croissance infinie, euh, de prospérité avec la croissance, etc. Et ces fragilités, elles, elles sont de différents ordres. La première, c'est euh, du point de vue de, 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 de la santé humaine en lien avec la, la perte de la biodiversité. On le sait, la majorité aujourd'hui des scientifiques pointent le lien entre la perte de la biodiversité et euh, la santé humaine et la pandémie qu'on connaît. Euh, une des autres fragilités, euh, et c'était tout au début de, de, de la pandémie, c'est précisément les modèles d'un modèle économique globalisé. Nous étions tous euh, voilà, les, les yeux euh, rivés sur la Chine, qui était le seul producteur des masques, Et on a vu, euh, pendant la crise, effectivement, une concurrence entre les États euh, avec un enjeu qui était celui de la vie et de la mort de nos concitoyens. On a vu aussi sur les tarmacs de certains aéroports des services secrets euh, venir récupérer des masques pour leur propre, pour leur propre euh, population. Et si je, je dis ça, je ferai le lien tout de suite avec, la, avec le Green Deal, c'est que, de manière dramatique, je l'ai dit, cette pandémie a mis vraiment le doigt sur des choses que nous, euh, familles vertes, nous pointions depuis, depuis longtemps. Et si nous tirons les justes leçons de la crise, c'est-à-dire une nécessaire euh, réimplantation d'une économie à l'échelle euh, européenne. Donc, on, nous, nous avons le devoir, euh, en tirant les conclusions de la pandémie, de euh, repenser un projet industriel à l'échelle de l'Europe, ne fût-ce que pour les euh, fonctions vitales que ce soit se nourrir, s'habiller, se soigner. Hein, on l'a vu, je pense que l'exemple des masques est sans doute euh, le plus dramatique, puisqu'on sait qu'il a aussi sans doute pu coûter euh, certaines vies, etc. Et, euh, et par ailleurs, le fait de réimplanter, de, 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 de reconstruire la résilience de nos économies, euh, d'abord a un effet positif euh, sur nos producteurs, sur nos entreprises, 
euh, et aussi nous permet de, voilà, de consommer des, 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 des produits qui ne viennent pas de l'autre côté de la planète avec tout ce, qu tout ce que ça suggère, tout ce que ça a comme, comme coût environnemental. Euh, et de ce point de vue-là, le, le plan de relance et de, et, 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 et de résilience euh, doit être saisi comme une, comme, comme une opportunité de s'inscrire précisément dans la vision systémique que j'évoquais tout à l'heure par, euh, par rapport au Green Deal. Euh, et, et, et les investissements euh, qui sont faits dans le cadre de, de ce plan de relance doivent s'inscrire et doivent placer les fondations d'une société plus résiliente et plus durable. Ça, c'est la responsabilité que nous avons de, alors, de faire de cette crise, euh, alors je, vais mettre, je vais prendre beaucoup de précautions pour le dire, mais de faire de cette crise dramatique une opportunité. Mais pour ça, il faut tirer les, les, les bonnes et les justes conclusions. Et euh, de ce point de vue-là, et là aussi, je le dis avec beaucoup de précaution, évidemment, le Green Deal arrive au bon moment. Il arrive au moment où, effectivement, on subit de plein fouet cette pandémie qui nous montre précisément le, voilà, la, la, la systémie de, 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 voilà, de, de, de nos organisations sociales, mais aussi la systémie de notre, de notre santé, la systémie de… Voilà, de, de on ne peut plus accepter aujourd'hui, après la, après la crise que nous venons de vivre, de continuer à, euh, à, à penser politiquement en silo. Et c'est précisément, je l'ai dit en introduction, pour moi, l'une des plus grandes vertus du Green Deal, c'est de montrer les liens et les connexions, euh, et de, de tenir compte des liens et des connexions euh, euh, voilà, entre les différentes politiques et, et de montrer que c'est euh, comme dans j'ai oublié le nom, le jeu pour ces enfants où euh, on touche à une pièce et, et, et c'est tout c'est tout qui s'effondre euh, donc euh, je, 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 je pense que oui le, 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 cette crise pandémique et euh, le Green Deal qui vient à l'agenda au même moment la, crise, la pandémie devrait nous servir de levier pour vraiment essayer d'aller de, 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 le plus loin possible dans la mise en œuvre de ce, de ce, de ce Green Deal. Um, I was reading the question. Um, je ne sais pas si j'ai répondu, Eva, assez clairement à la, à la position, mais donc c'est la, ré, voilà, la, la, yes. la réimplantation d'une industrie à l'échelle européenne c'est aussi le lien entre la perte de la biodiversité et la santé humaine. Euh, voilà. But maybe if I may add just one thing, please, Eva. Yes, it was thank about, you. Yeah, it was about agriculture. Um, et j'étais très uh, sensible à ce que Iman disait. Um, donc, il y avait un conseil environnement informel tout à l'heure, mais pendant lequel uh, il me semble que la présidence portugaise a dû annoncer que uh, la chemical strategy avait été adopté. Et donc, c'est un des éléments euh, du Green Deal. Et euh, c'est vrai qu'en Belgique, euh, souvent, l'agriculture, quand, quand les postes, quand les compétences ministérielles sont attribuées, euh, l'agriculture est rarement laissée aux mains de ceux qui ont l'environnement, etc., pour être, pour être sûr qu'il voilà, euh, y, un, un, voilà, y ait un contrôle euh, par les lobbies, pour le dire un peu rapidement, et pour pouvoir continuer à mettre des limites dans les avancées que l'on peut avoir du point de vue environnemental. Et, et, et du coup, la, la chemical strategy, pour moi, est aussi un levier pour aller discuter avec mon collègue de l'agriculture en disant aujourd'hui, ce n'est pas moi la ministre écologique, c'est le Green Deal et c'est la stratégie qui a été adoptée. Et comment est-ce qu'on fait aujourd'hui pour être à côté de nos agriculteurs Parce que moi, je refuse que l'on continue de dire des vers que euh, voilà, nous sommes contre les agriculteurs, nous sommes précisément avec eux, nous sommes avec eux lorsque nous dénonçons la PAC et tout ce que ça a comme effet euh, sur leur santé hein, quand ils utilisent ces pesticides, nous sommes à côté d'eux contre la PAC parce qu'on sait comment tous les standards ont été revus à la baisse et notamment leurs moyens de subsistance, euh, etc., etc. Et donc je pense, en tout cas, et je, 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 je terminerai là, je répète la conclusion que j'ai faite lors de ma première intervention, c'est quelle que soit réellement la mise en œuvre, les ambitions, les volontés des uns et des autres par rapport à ce Green Deal. En tout cas, moi, j'ai décidé d'y voir un levier puissant à l'échelle nationale et un allié dans la mise en œuvre d'une vision transversale et d'une véritable révolution culturelle. Merci. 
Thank you very much, um, Zakia. Um, Terry, um, Zakia mentioned that all EU member states are currently preparing national recovery and resilience plans, which have to be submitted until end April um, 2021. Um, and I would also like to ask you, what is the way forward to design recovery packages that are compatible with the European Green Deal? What can national governments do and what should the European institutions provide to ensure that we are um, building back better? Um, Sakia also mentioned that um, in the very beginning. So Terry, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva. Um, as, I, as I mentioned already earlier, we uh, our government decided already last, I believe, September that we will spend um, at least half of the, the European uh, uh, recovery um, facility, uh, recovery and resilience facility um, funds to directly to climate um, action. So there is a already at the European level, I think uh, what the members of parliament and the commission have already well um, also well, together with our governments, it's, it's, a, it's a European legislation uh, agreed is to set some minimal minimum thresholds like the 37% to climate and 20% to digital. Uh, transformation um, and we will respect those but we have actually decided to go uh, further and I think again um, it has been important that, that the the way to categorize something as as green or, or climate action has that we have uniform rules for that that um, say Finland can't say uh, decide by itself that uh, peat is renewable or, or uh, um, uh, a climate action. So I think that's very important. It concentrates mind and it, it creates um, transparency. It, it also ensures that we, we put the public uh, resources, this is uh, taxpayers' money, uh, that it, it, is, it will be well spent. I think this is what we... And there I see um, that we, we work in, in the government to make sure that within the boundaries of the EU regulation, the, the, the money is well spent in a, in a manner that, as I said earlier, that will accelerate the transformation, the green transformation, the climate transformation, the biodiversity transformation, uh, the circular economy transformation. Um, and then what, we, what helps us a lot is that at the European level, things like the standards uh, of do no harm, uh, that that is uh, well defined and well implemented uh, across European Union. Uh, this is also all of our taxpayers' money. Uh, we want that to be insured across European Union. Um, so the do no harm is very important uh, throughout the, the recovery package, but also throughout the, the, the union budget, the whole multi-annual financial framework um, and agricultural uh, budget, um, ideally. Uh, and uh, then there's elements of climate tracking, for example, that the rules that are now applied in the RRF for um, determining whether uh, something is, is climate uh, action or not. Uh, and again, I would stress that um, we need at the European level um, science-based uh, criteria for things like the taxonomy uh, climate action classification. So yeah, I think there there is a, there is a lot that we we need to still uh, ensure at the national level, but the, it, it certainly helps us towards a, a green deal transformation that we're looking for when we have common rules at the European level that are based on on science. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, Iman, I would like to come back um, to, to your first input where you also mentioned the transport sector. Well, sustainable transport and mobility um, are key to tackle the climate crisis and to achieve the targets of the European Green Deal. Transport today accounts for nearly 30% of the CO2 emissions within the European Union and has actually failed to decrease emissions since 1990. So my question is, how can the EU tackle the issue while connecting citizens, creating green jobs and leading the innovation in the sector? And how do you assess the European sustainable and smart mobility strategy? Eamon, the floor is yours. Um, I, I, I started in politics as a transport campaigner. I was chair of the Dublin cycling campaign. 
And I remember my my partner then, my now wife, I would always be telling her, you mark my words, it's about to change. Dublin's going to become like Copenhagen. And and I remember for those 30 years, we'd go, I'd go to the commission and they had superb sustainable transport strategy. But 30 years later, I'm still saying, you mark my words, we're we are about to change. Now this time we are about to change. And 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 uh but but it, we know we've known for 30 years in campaigning that this switch to active travel, this this idea of a 15 minute city wasn't wasn't invented last year. I mean, OK, it was a good name for it, but but we we are we had the concept around good planning and, and urban design and so on for, for a long time. And it was not in many countries. Some countries have done very better than others. But um, so. What will be different this time? I think the Recovering Resilience Fund helps. It's not a, it's like, okay, it's 700 billion, but it seems strange to say, it's not actually that big. You know, it, 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 bring it down to, translation to Irish money, we'll get less than a billion. And, and, what, and we're spending uh, um, each year about 3 billion on transport. So even in, uh, even in that area, in, you know, it's, it's not, but it is, it's a signal. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a chance to break the cycle of how we spend on roads, and, and or, or how we do connect housing and planning and transport. So, so in our case, what we are be applying for is is new train systems for our cities like Cork and Limerick, and 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 they're projects that have never had rail investment like that. And and so and sometimes when the money's coming from outside, in a way. It's our money. It's our union money. Is all our shared resources, but when it's seen as outside the ordinary budget process, it allows you sometimes to do something slightly different. So, so that's what we're doing in this case, is something slightly different. Um, and I think uh, going back to the the how we have to do this in Europe, in like there needs to be a change, like the whole Europe Ten T projects has always typically been about the big, you know, the big infrastructure, the big ports or airports or, or big uh, systems. And in some ways, I think um, this might be, in my mind, what's happening now, particularly with COVID, the idea about the local, the local environment, the local street, the local is center stage and, and share best experience of that. Like I'm, I'm fascinated with what's going on in Paris, which is gives real hope and up, and then to copy that and and um, so so I think it's not as if the European Commission is saying something new. We've all been saying this for thirty years in policy circles, but we haven't been able to translate it. And, and I do think the Green Deal and and the as much I was slightly critical earlier. I'm not critical I'm, I'm just impatient i'm impatient after 30 years of campaigning for sustainable transport that it's it's time now thank you very much Eamon. um also um for pointing to the fact that um well the european green deal has to be implemented on the european on the national on the local level um as well that's very important Henrike, I would like to pose you a question. You mentioned that we need rapid and economically feasible solutions to tackle the climate crisis. Um, well, nuclear power is today the most expensive and the slowest form of electricity, electricity generation, as it takes a very long time to build um, new reactors. Actually, every euro invested in new nuclear power plants makes the climate crisis worse because capital is tied up and this money cannot be used to invest in efficient climate protection options such as renewables and um, energy efficiency. However, the nuclear lobby wrongly points to nuclear power as a solution to solve the climate crisis. And I would like to ask you, uh, because we can see those tendencies in a lot of EU member states, how to actually make sure that this ill-advised myth is not spreading any longer. Yeah, thank you very much for this interesting question. Of course, we have to use um, um, what we know, our knowledge, right, uh, to, um, to, to our arguments, because, of course, we, we live in a climate emergency. It's just like that. The question 
of urgency must be put first. And it's now about how we can reduce greenhouse gases as quick as possible and as efficient as possible. And of course, we have to be pragmatic, but uh, and to act in the fastest possible way. But um, there's no question about that. The construction of new power plants, the nuclear power is simply no option. And it's the most expensive form of electricity generation today. You were just mentioning it. it and uh, it takes a long time to build reactors. And in other words, every euro invested in new nuclear power plants makes the climate crisis even worse. Also because this money can't be invested in efficient climate protection options. Um, so the EU should definitely not label nuclear as a sustainable economic activity and investments. Um, we have a lot of discussions in the committees with our peer colleagues on this issue. We have a very uh, green perspective here and I believe that labeling nuclear sustainable is just misleading uh, for EU citizens and this inclusion would undermine private and institutional investors trust, defeat the whole purpose of a taxonomy and could be considered labeling fraud. It's just like that. And the European consumers who choose a sustainable investment in good faith to support the energy transition could end up unwillingly giving money to the nuclear sector from the back door. And this is what we don't want, of course, you know, this is not what we want, we want change here. And uh, let's remind to the fact that the proposed methodology, uh, the taxonomy is built on the need to qualify on two criteria, criteria. a sustainable economy, uh, economic activity should contribute substantially to one or more environmental objectives without causing significant harm to, um, to any other. Uh, so in my view, labeling nuclear sustainable drains funding away from renewables and efficiency and the inclusion of nuclear would slow down the energy and climate transition by redirecting the necessary investment away from renewables and from energy efficiency towards a costly, unsafe technology that can't play a significant role in the achievement of net zero emission economy by 2050 at the latest. And uh, you were asking maybe, or you were thinking if Germany will reverse its nuclear phase out, right? Um, to be short, I don't think that we will uh, have a different direction there. I don't think so. There's no future for nuclear energy, neither in Europe nor in Germany. And I'm confident that German voters will express that again in the upcoming Bundestag election, right? Uh, as well as supporting the Green Perspective here. Thank you very much, Henrike. Uh, we will now open the discussion for questions uh, of the audience. And I would like to start with three sets of questions and ask the speakers to answer the questions of their choice. Um, so the first uh, set of questions is, um, it is not only agricultural policy. How, for example, is the envisaged eu Mercosur agreement to be reconciled with the Green Deal? and also the insufficient position of the Commission on the en Energy um, uh, Charter Treaty. Um, it is totally demotivating that such incoherencies continue. Which areas of the European Green Deal must be addressed? Um, this is the question, which areas need to be revised and where are uh, major shortcomings and existing contradictions uh, besides agricultural policy? Um, then there is a second um, set of questions, which role do citizens play when it comes to the implementation of the European Green Deal and how do the Greens involve citizens in the um, transition process? Um, I would um, like to mention here that in the beginning of this month, the Council of the European Union gave its approval to the Conference on the Future of Europe. And the aim of this conference is to involve citizens in a wide ranging debate on Europe's future in the coming decade and beyond. So this might be also a moment. And the um, last set of questions is, how do we explain the seemingly missing link between measures on gender equality and the European Green Deal? How can the EU deal with the danger of a backlash on gender equality in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic? And um, I would now like to give uh, the floor to Eamon first, then Zakia, Terry, and Henrika. Very good, Eva. Then I can get to pick which question, which is, is very up first, which is great. And, and I'm going to take the first question on trade. And partly because we're in the very uh, intense debate in the Irish Greens, people may know we, we, we have an issue. We have to, whether we ratify the CETA trade deal in government 
And that's so we're looking a lot at trade issues and um, and trade and climate issues. And also, which is a really good thing, is our European Greens teams is, is starting to look at this as well. Working group uh, looking in real detail as what do we want on, on sustainable trade and trade and climate and so on. And, and I think we're going to work on that for the next number of months, which I think is really important. Um, and it's complicated. Um, some things are clear. I, I think all of us are agreed that Mercosur cannot prog pro progress. Uh, the uh, provisions regarding agriculture and to the, that issue would make it hugely damaging. Uh, and I think it, there's real opposition to to it. Uh, it's um, it, it's its progression. Um, it, there is the Energy Charter Treaty, and it's interesting, you hear different views, and it was a good event was at last week on this uh, with some of the environmental NGO community. Who uh, And the question is whether you reform or whether you remove, and remove has difficulties, but also the, in the it's interesting looking at that as an example. There have, as I understand, been a good number of cases which have been taken by the likes of the renewable industry, where they might look for, you know, their that they ran into difficulties in terms of with national systems and wanted a use the energy chart treat which we which was kind of designed for fossil fuel industry in the eastern in as the rush opened up ended up being used in some instances to support renewables and to make an important case that needs to be made in protecting renewables so it's not that we don't want any in dispute resolution mechanisms or, or that you know we need to make sure that they that they're that they're not overly supporting corporate interests but that they're also they are sometimes we need arbitration or dispute mechanisms um and i think there is a unique moment now. There's always a stream of trade agreements coming, but Europe has a number where we should be looking at stitching in new provisions for climate and for dealing in cross-border trade to make sure it takes proper account of the social and environmental standards we want to protect. Um, and I think, so a lot of the work, I think we, we, we're always focusing on stopping the latest thing, like we need to stop Mercosur, we, but actually we also need to get in at an early stage and start creating the sort of trading environment that we want and uh, including cross-border carbon adjustment mechanisms and all the other, and including maybe more international court mechanisms so that there it is, uh, if, if, if you need to go outside national court jurisdiction, you still have an international court structure that you can turn to rather than a kind of an unknown arbitration system. So I think our role is, is in creating the new trade environment through whatever new trade agreements are coming and, and designing it from the start from a green perspective is, is, is what's key at this moment in time. Thank you very much, Iman. Zakia, you can, of course, also um, pick this question, but um, there were others concerning the role of um, uh, citizens, how to in involve citizens and um, the missing link uh, um, between gender and the European Green Deal. So the fact that the European Green Deal is um, gender blind. So Zakia, please go ahead. Merci, Eva, rapidement. Um, Peut-être sur la première, compléter ce qui vient d'être dit, euh, et peut-être par un élément qu'on a on n'a pas encore discuté, mais qui fait l'objet de la deuxième question à laquelle je répondrai aussi sur le citoyen. Moi, ce qui m'inquiète le plus dans les contradictions qu'on a relevées euh, au sein des politiques européennes, c'est que ça crée encore un peu plus de défiance du citoyen vis-à-vis -vis du politique. Je pense que dès le moment où on a choisi, où l'Europe a choisi euh, euh, de prendre la voie du, du Green Deal, de la neutralité carbone euh, à l'horizon de 2050, nous devons aux citoyens de la cohérence. Et donc, je pense qu'il est dangereux, effectivement, d'annoncer de, des ambitions climatiques, etc. C'est un peu comme si on donnait quelque chose de la main droite et puis qu'on le retirait de la main gauche. Et c'est ce manque de cohérence qui euh, sape la démocratie, parce que les citoyens ne font plus confiance aux politiques. 
et sur les marchés, sur les, comment, les traités commerciaux, etc., je pense que la force aussi du Green Deal, c'est que précisément, elle a pour ambition de mettre les États, enfin, bon, je le dis un peu, c'est un peu rapide, hein, mais au même niveau, c'est-à-dire que les standards européens seront désormais les standards de l'Europe. Et moi, j'ai la conviction que je n'imagine pas que certains veuillent se fermer du marché européen. Euh, et, et, et donc, nos traités, pour autant que nous respections et que nous renforcions nos, euh, nos critères euh, sociaux, environnementaux à l'échelle européenne, euh, seront une force dans la négociation des prochains accords. Parce qu'on a du mal à imaginer euh, même les États-Unis ou la Chine se fermer au marché européen. Euh, sur la deuxième question, alors, sur la question de la participation des citoyens par rapport au Green Deal, etc. J'ai la responsabilité, c'est inscrit dans notre accord de majorité, d'organiser des tables rondes hein, autour du climat, mais aussi un débat national et puis un débat international sur la transition juste. Et donc, si effectivement nous avons décidé des objectifs, hein, nous avons soutenu le rehaussement des objectifs à hein, au minimum moins 55% à l'échelle européenne, nous souhaitons mettre en débat public le chemin pour atteindre ces, euh, ces objectifs. Hein. Mon collègue à la région Wallonne a mis en place... Euh, il y a un dispositif de consultation citoyenne avec une méthodologie très, très élaborée où différents scénarios sont sur la table et sont discutés avec les citoyens. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, on est dans une étape où, effectivement, après que les scientifiques et les experts ont pris toute la place dans le débat public pour expliquer, pour convaincre de l'urgence climatique, aujourd'hui, on est à l'étape du rassemblement autour du chemin à prendre. Et, et on ne se rassemblera que si, effectivement, euh, d'abord, les, les, on, on démocratise le débat, c'est-à-dire qu'on qu permette à tout le monde, à ceux qui ne se sont jamais sentis concernés par ce débat-là, de pouvoir le comprendre, de pouvoir mesurer les enjeux, euh, de telle sorte qu'ils puissent aussi imaginer un avenir euh, enviable et positif pour eux comme pour leurs enfants. Et on aura l'ensemble des citoyens avec nous que si aussi, outre la démocratisation du débat, que s'ils ils perçoivent les propositions, la transition comme étant, euh, comme étant juste, comme étant équitable dans les moyens mis en œuvre, mais aussi dans les effets que la transition aura. Et ça passe par le débat public, en effet. Et donc, nous allons organiser, à l'instar de ce qui s'est passé euh, aux Pays-Bas, après la condamnation dans le cadre de l'affaire aussi du climat de ZAC, nous allons organiser un débat public pour co-construire, pour rassurer. Alors, j'ai un exemple évidemment en tête qui est vraiment sans doute un des débats les plus, les plus, les plus difficiles à l'échelle de l'enjeu de la justice sociale, c'est la taxe carbone. On sait que c'est un levier et un outil important d'une politique climatique ambitieuse. Et en même temps, tout de suite, c'est une levée de bouclier légitime, tellement les gens ont peur d'abord et surtout les plus faibles d'entre nous, dont on sait qu'ils sont aujourd'hui les victimes des changements climatiques. Il ne faudrait pas qu'ils subissent une double peine en étant eux-mêmes les victimes de la transition. Et donc, ça passe par le dialogue. Et voilà, et donc j'ai la charge d'organiser effectivement des débats publics autour du chemin à emprunter pour qu'il soit le plus juste possible pour atteindre les objectifs qu'on s'est qu assignés. Et alors, sur la gender equality, là, je pense effectivement que, notamment, on sait que la pollution, la pollution chimique touche effectivement beaucoup plus les femmes, puisqu'on sait qu'elles voilà, qu 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 continuent à porter un maximum de tâches ménagères ou domestiques à la maison, qu'elles utilisent des produits chimiques, etc. Donc, il y a un vrai enjeu de ce point de vue-là. Et en même temps, je pense qu'on doit être attentif, parce que c'est aussi... Euh, voilà, des, des choses que, que, que j'entendais beaucoup sur ben oui, euh, le, le projet écologiste, il est sympa, mais en même temps, c'est un projet qui euh, surcharge de nouveau les femmes, puisque, en effet, si on, on fabrique nous-mêmes nos produits ménagers, si euh, on, euh, on cultive nous-mêmes euh, euh, voilà, notre alimentation, ça tombe toujours sur le dos des femmes. Et donc, le projet écologiste est un projet qui est mauvais pour les femmes. Parce que... Et donc, euh, moi, je dis non, le projet écologiste ne fait que mettre encore plus en lumière l'organisation patriarcale de notre société, de même que la pandémie vient de le faire, de même que les crises économiques, on sait, 
hein, au moment des crises économiques, c est, c est, qui est-ce qu'on renvoie à, à la maison en premier lieu Ce sont les femmes. Euh, et donc, oui, il faut effectivement euh, euh, voilà, garder, garder à l'esprit la dimension du genre. Et la secrétaire d'État euh, à l'égalité, ma collègue au gouvernement, est aussi une verte, une écolo. Et euh, c'est effectivement une dimension que sur laquelle on souhaite avancer, avancer ensemble, euh, effectivement. Thank you very much, um, Zakia. Terry, now the floor is yours for answering the questions you would like to respond to. Thank you, uh, Eva. Um, let me pick two uh, uh, out of the options. And I'll just uh, shortly to, to react um, to Eamon and, and um, come back to the issue of trade, I think um, there, is, um, there is an interesting um, positive president in my view if there is a in, in the brexit uh, there was nothing positive in a, in a sense but the eu uk trade deal i think made a, a important first step where uh, in fact the environment the sustainability and the labor rights part parts of the agreement are enforceable uh, through trade measures like all the other provisions of the trade deal and i think this is maybe not done ever before and and while we're Uh, while the Commission is negotiating uh, additional uh, protocols uh, to the Mer Mercosur for, for the European Union, I, in my view, I think uh, this is exactly what we should uh, be looking at, uh, that those commitments that are made for, towards sustainable development and climate protection uh, in, in the trade agreement, but also the international commitments that parties to a trade agreement have entered, like our NDC or, or the NDC of, of Mercosur countries, that those commitments would be enforceable through, through trade as well. I think this could be a, a powerful um, lever for, for international uh, environmental law. And I wanted to come back also a little bit on, on how to involve the citizens or how, how do we see this? I think First of all, it's important to recognize that without the involvement of the citizens, without uh, Fridays for Future, uh, I don't think we would be here discussing European Green Deal. I think this is all on the table because we had uh, European elections that were dominated by citizens concerned about the planet and about the climate. Um, so so it, it is clearly Uh, a power, powerful uh, actor, and and um, something to 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 we mobilize or we tap force from. Um, what we have done in Finland, for example, is to set up a panel on just transition. Uh, this is a, a to to look at the the climate policy action in order to ensure that the measures that we take are uh, um, are fair. Uh, and and we have involved stakeholders in that panel, but it's fairly open and we take experts on different areas and we bring all the government policies in different areas for a debate in there. Uh, but we will also engage and we will use citizens panels and, and this is um, uh, I think something that maybe Zakia and, and Belgium is also thinking about is a, is a sort of random set of people. We have just sent uh, for our, our uh, climate plan for the effort sharing sectors. We have um, sent a letter to 50,000 people, random people, uh, to volunteer for, to be in a panel. And, and then from the volunteers will be selected a representative group uh, uh, with uh, age groups, uh, female, male, um, uh, different areas, uh, different, I don't know how, but this is a very scientific exercise to bring a representative group of people together. And they will be discussing climate policies, like perhaps transport policy, um, Uh, possibly um, uh, heating emissions. And I think it's, it's very interesting to, and, and they will be given expert information and they will deliver it. And I think this is very useful for the policymakers as well, this kind of direct uh, deliberative uh, democracy to, to support and, and bring information to the elected representatives. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And Henrique, the floor is yours now. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, let me talk um, as well about uh, the, the gender aspect and the financial situation of women uh, during the corona uh, pandemic and the Green Deal. 
Uh, I think indeed it's very remarkable that in the announcement of the European Green Deal, the gender aspect or women in general weren't mentioned at all, right? And um, that was the case, even if Europe, the European Commission has announced a gender equality strategy uh, in March, which is supposed to address the still striking inequalities women have to face in almost every uh, aspect of their life and work. And this clearly shows, I think, that the Commission is determined to tackle those problems, but we really have to integrate these strategies into the measures of the Green Deal as well. And uh, of course, when we look at the sectors that are predominantly addressed by the Green Deal, we see sectors like energy, construction, or the industry. So these are currently all man-dominated sectors. But of course, we have a structural problem here, right? Why, why this is the case that this is a man-dominated sectors? Uh, women are still the ones who work much more in the background, um, working in social jobs or honorary jobs, taking care of the families and the households instead of going to the university to get one of those industry jobs, for example, right? And at the same time, they're much more vulnerable when it comes to the dangers of falling into poverty, uh, we have seen these problems falling back uh, on us in the last year during the COVID crisis in a very relevant matter, right? And um, women have not only been hit hard economically by the crisis, but all the, at the same time, they have experienced growing numbers of domestic violence. Um, uh, so this is what we have on the table as a problem. But of course, we can also uh, work on these structural programs also on, at the European level. And we as Greens, we were responsible also for a successful fight against these problems, considering the EU's long-term budget, uh, because it includes gender budgeting, right? The tracking introduced in this budget period will be uh, the basis for highlighting imbalances on the basis of concrete figures and for shaping the next multi-year multi financial framework in a gender fair manner. And by anchoring the major programs such as regional funding and the European Social Fund and member states, gender equal budgets are encouraged there too. So I think, I think this is a very positive signal. There's still a lot to do in that regard. But also if you look at the next generation EU reconstruction plan, the member states must explain what effects planned measures will have on women and on men. So uh, um, our fight has a piecemeal quality, right, uh, to do that, but it's, it's a horizontal issue somehow, but uh, we can do something about it. And this is also why I, together with my green colleagues, uh, for, uh, fight in the public sector loan facility as, a, as a, one of those pillars um, of the just transition mechanism. Um, uh, currently fighting to integrate a gender impact assessment, which aims to put an end to the advantages of men when it comes to the allocation of funding, right? To have a real equal funding. Uh, th this is the goal what we have and what, what is the de declared goal as well from the European perspective. So we see the climate crisis and the gender inequalities, they're structural, they're intertwined, but we need a socially just Europe. And this is what we Greens are fighting for in the European Parliament and what is the uh, Green Deal about and what is also a positive and important aspect as well. Thank you, Henrike, very much. Um, since we are running out of time, but um, since we would really like to include um, as many aspects as possible from, uh, the, from our viewers, I would like to pose now uh, four questions to you. Uh, they are uh, directed um, to you. And I would like to give you one minute, up to one minute to answer this question. So I would like to start with Henrike. Um, I know that this is a complicated question, but I hope you will, um, you will make it in one minute. Which role can carbon pricing on the EU level, but also the national level play in setting incentives for a decarbonized economy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, um, we, can, we can say carbon pricing is an important tool to achieve the objectives of the Green Deal. The polluters have to pay the price for polluting. And uh, in a world that is increasingly feeling the consequences of climate change, this is a central point. And the EU's emission trading system reflects exactly that thought and is the world's largest carbon pricing system. And the EU emissions trading system directive has been a central piece of legislation to incentivize the decarbonization of power generation of industry and the aviation. 
And um, that despite the rising price of carbon, the environmental and the cost for society of uh, GHG emissions is still higher by more than a magnitude. A surplus of emissions allowance and free allocations has led to insufficient price signals to trigger the systematic shift away from fossil fuels toward green solutions. Um, well, there, I, I think uh, one minute is very, very, is very short to answer that question, but let just uh, add me something to the carbon border adjustment mechanism in this context in order to create a loving playing field for heavy industry inside Europe and outside Europe. The Commission will propose such a mechanism as an alternative, and I think that's a very great and useful tool we have to use. And to sum up, let's say clearly, yes, carbon pricing on the EU level, but also on the national level, plays a very strong role in setting incentives for a decarbonized economy. Thank you very much. Now a question to Terry. Um, does the European Green Deal proposals of the European Commission sufficiently address the problem of biodiversity loss? Thank you for, for the question. I think um, we're still uh, we're in the process now with the with the biodiversity strategy. I think that's um, uh, that's a, a very good start, and I think there's some very good initiatives uh, and and decisions there to go for um, uh, increasing the protected areas and and to 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 have a, a good position for for the European Union, also for the international. Uh, biodiversity negotiation. I think the very important um, proposal that we're still waiting for is the restoration um, proposal, um, which would, I think, um, I'm looking forward to. I, I think this would be a very important European start. I think it's been something that, again, uh, for over the years, um, at the European level, um, Commission hasn't, hasn't dared to start. After the soil directive a uh, long time ago, um, didn't manage to make it through the finish line. I think this is the first time, and I think it would be a very important start. As I said, we, we have already started in, in Finland to um, put, um, to plan program and, and also finance uh, nature restoration, not just protection, but also restoration of, uh, of natural areas. And, and the restoration, I think it will be interesting to see to what extent also um, um, uh, sort of um, degraded lands, uh, polluted land, but also uh, degraded agricultural lands will be will be covered, uh, and and how what kind of tools? So I think um, th the green deal is not uh, done yet, <laughs> and and we're we're still uh, looking. Uh, we we need still proposals and action from the Commission, and we need implementation in in the member states. I think another um, perhaps lacking thing still is uh, finance uh, for the management of biodiversity. And, and here I would hope that the agricultural uh, funds and the other EU funds will do better than they've done before. And, and I think there's probably still um, much beyond what is in the current MFF that would need to happen. So there we need action at the member states level and, and, and we need to improve the EU action further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, Eamon. The question to you is how to prevent unemployment while phasing out fossil fuels as fast as possible. Which mechanisms can help to leave no one behind in the transition? I think the most effective employment is in the retrofishing area. I know it's all we always go to it, but it's it's one in an Irish example. So our economy is 5 million people, and, and I think we can create about 30,000 jobs, which is not insignificant. And, and, uh, and, and it's over a 20, 30 year period, we're going to have to do it. So it's, it's very um, predictable. And now it's, it's going to be a challenge to, to get the finance and to deliver, but that's the first one. But also, I think, going back to what Terry said, and I love the fact that it's a Finnish minister wanting to get things over the finish line. But I think to, to make the point that Terry made on that, whether financing for biodiversity, I, I think that would also, we need a whole generation of young people who we say for the next 30, 40 years, there will be a career in, in protecting nature and payment for that. Now, that's not yet, as Terry said, we don't have that 
but but I think it's it's a real pot potential, and particularly because it's in areas maybe that are have the skills for some of the jobs are going to be lost. So those two would be my top of my agenda. Thank you very much, Iman. Also for sticking to the time. Um, then actually, I have a last question to Zakia. Zakia, which support do you need from the European Parliament and from Greens all around Europe? Uh, so, have you said, as you said, have you said, as you've said, sorry, donc, uh, je suis dans un gouvernement avec sept partis, hein, des libéraux, des socialistes, des verts, et pour trouver euh, des éléments qui, qui nous rassemblent, il faut beaucoup de négociations. Et euh, la vertu du Green Deal a été que précisément, je n'ai pas dû le négocier, il nous a été imposé par l'Europe. Et donc, ce que j'attends, c'est d'abord que l'Europe, quand elle analyse le plan de relance et de résilience, par exemple, fasse une analyse pointue des projets qui sont introduits. Dans la dynamique belge, certains projets ont été introduits dont moi, je ne suis pas certaine qu'ils répondent aux critères. Et nous n'avons pas été en capacité, en interne, à les mettre de côté et donc j'espère que la commission le fera j'espère aussi que la commission tiendra sur effectivement les critères de sélection et les objectifs ambitieux qu'elle a tenus parce que je l'ai dit dans un gouvernement où on est aussi nombreux dans un pays où on a autant de gouvernements quelque chose qui s'impose à nous tous sans que l'un ou l'autre n'est euh, l'impression de perdre dans le cadre d'une négociation et sans doute ce qui est le meilleur levier pour moi dans le sens d'une euh, transition juste. Et donc, euh, voilà, tenez bon euh, les verts au Parlement, continuez à être exigeants, continuez à négocier comme vous l'avez fait. Hein, il y a maintenant juste cinq ans, on n'aurait pas imaginé que l'on serait aujourd'hui euh, dans la situation dans, lesquelles, dans laquelle on est avec euh, un train de européen, mais international aussi. Hier, l'Inde annonce la, euh, un objectif de neutralité climatique à, à l'horizon 2050. La Chine l'a annoncé à l'horizon 2060. Alors, ça ne reste aujourd'hui que des intentions et des déclarations, mais on ne les a jamais entendues auparavant. Voilà. Et c'est déjà un bon début quand on voit d'où on vient, mais il n'y a plus de temps à perdre. Thank you very much, um, Zakia. I would like to thank the speakers and viewers um, for their participation and excellent contributions. Um, please note that the questions which uh, have not been answered during our debate are not lost, um, and they will be forwarded by the staff to the respective speakers of the conference. And um, please allow me a last remark on behalf of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. We just published the European Mobility Atlas. You are welcome to check it out, and we'll find the link in the chat. Um, well, thank you again, Zakia. Thank you, Iman, Terry, and Henrique. This has been a very inspiring discussion, and I would now like to pass the floor to Henrique for her closing remarks. Have a nice evening. Yeah, thank you very much to Eva for your wonderful uh, moderation of our exchange. I really uh, appreciate it. It was a real pleasure to uh, have you um, with us. And um, I think uh, what we were seeing tonight, um, how it could work, right? That we work together on a European level and at a national level as well, that we learn from each other. And I really loved um, the example that Terry um, uh, just um, told us Uh, because actually, you know, when you were mentioning uh, 50% climate spending uh, on the recovery funds, this is what actually we, we, um, we were fighting for on the uh, EU budget in general, right? Like last year, 50% climate um, uh, related spending. Um, so you can see how everything is linked together. And if we fight together for all these uh, green ideas in the context of the European Green Deal, we can really make some efforts. And I hope that this is not only a green perspective, but also for other political groups. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that also the European citizens uh, that was mentioned um, the whole evening as well, the, the important aspect of the civil society, right? That they demand for that change, that we really work towards a sustainable future um, 
protecting the climate and um, the environment and um, having a good future together in Europe, right? So thanks, um, dear Zakia, thanks to Imon, and thanks to Terry for being with us tonight, having you with us was a real inspiration for our work in the parliament as well. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks um, for the, uh, to the interpreters for the amazing work. Uh, I know it's a challenge, right? We were talking about many, many details tonight. And uh, last but not least, thanks to you, dear uh, listeners, for your participation and your many, many questions that are not lost, of course, even if they're not answered yet as Eva mentioned before. And um, if you still have, are hungry for talking and discussing um, all the aspects of the European Green Deal, please feel free to join us tomorrow uh, in our, one of our five topical webinars. You were finding it in the chat for details are po posted now again in the chat, I think. And we had actually nearly close to 2000 participants registered for all the webinars in our conference on the European Green Deal today. Um, that shows how timely and how important this debate is. And we Greens are committed to make the European Green Deal a success. We do that together on the European level, on the national level. Thank you very much again and see you again tomorrow. I hope it would be a real pleasure to see you all again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.